take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. Uh, now, you might disagree with that. I'm not here to, to start a debate on who the GOAT is in NBA basketball, but uh, I would argue that he is the greatest. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it kind of started back in 1982. He was playing for uh, North Carolina, and he went to the NCAA championship game, and it was Michael Jordan's shot that gave them the victory in that game, bringing the title to uh, the Tar Heels as they defeated uh, Georgetown, okay, not this Georgetown, but Georgetown University. Um, he went to, on to play for the Chicago Bulls and led that team to not one, two, three, four, or five, but six national championship titles. And he did it in really spectacular fashion by doing two three-peats. That is a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back run at the championship. Uh, Michael was known uh, for single-handedly deciding 25 basketball games in his career um, with his shot or, or free throw in the final uh, kind of 20 to 25 seconds of, of the game. Two of those games just happened to be NBA Finals games. He became known as Air Jordan for his just uncanny ability to, to run and kind of leap from around the free throw line and just soar through the air for a slam dunk. Uh, he was an amazing, incredible athlete. He was fast. He was quick. He was talented. He was clutch. There's many as shots that he was taking um, in the final seconds of the game. But Michael Jordan was not born a basketball star. Michael Jordan was not born a champion. Michael B Jordan was not born victorious. There was a lot of work. There was a lot of preparation. There was years, even decades of practice that had to be put in before that could show up on the game. I did some research this past week into Michael Jordan's kind of training regimen, and everything kind of falls into two categories. He had a strength training, and he had skills training. Uh, when he joined the NBA, uh, his coaches quickly realized that when he was by himself or kind of one-on-one -on -one or in front of the pack, I mean, he just did incredible athletic feats. But when he got in the paint, in the, in the paint in basketball, that's where, that's where it gets crowded. That's where all the, the people are, um, specifically the big people, okay, the tall people. When he got into the paint, he was very easily knocked around. And so they realized that he's weak, so they said, we've got to get you on this strength training regiment. And at first, Michael Jordan said, no thanks. It's going to mess up my shot. It's going to mess up my game. But they said, no, you need to be strengthened in the core if you're going to display power on the court. And so they started him on this training, not to train his muscles or his arm muscles or his legs muscles, but to strengthen his core. And over time, he became stronger in that hand-to-hand -hand combat of, of basketball. Not only that, was there strength training, but there was skills training. Before the game, or sorry, before team practice or after team practice, he would often stay in the gym by himself, maybe with one other partner, and he would pick a spot and he would shoot shot after shot after shot after shot. He would shoot hundreds of these shots until he perfected it or until it became second nature to him. And so I say that to say what we see lived out in the game is only an overflow of what Michael Jordan did in practice. We see the, the miracle shot, but for Michael Jordan, that was one of a thousand shots that he had taken that week. So there's a lot of preparation that we need, right? There's some 
practice that we need. We've been talking about putting on the uh, full armor of God, not part of the armor, but the full armor. Now, look, some of the armor is for strength training. It trains us to the core. It allows us to, to stand firm. When you're wearing the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, that is like strength. That is, that is the core when we get into that, that, that hand-to-hand combat. But we also need skills training. Paul says there's some armor we are to take up. He says, take up the shield of faith. Take up the helmet of salvation. And today we're going to look at one more uh, piece of armor that we take up. It's actually the first piece of offensive armor that we are called to take up. Look at verse 17. He says, take up the helmet of of salvation. We talked about that last week. That's our identity in Christ. That means if you are saved, you are to live saved and recognize yourself as a child of God, saved by grace through faith. And then he says, and a second thing we're to take up, actually third, and the sword of the Spirit. And in case you're wondering, what is the sword of the Spirit, Paul tells us, which is the Word of God. Paul says, take up the sword. Quick thing about the sword. There were two words in the Greek for sword. Um, I often think of the long sword, uh, that medieval time. You got this three-foot or four-foot sword that you, uh, that you raise up to go to a sword fight with someone else. Anybody else you know, kind of follow me on that sword? But the sword that Paul uh, referred to was not the long sword. In fact, he used the word for the short sword. Sword. This would be considered a, a short sword. Um, they would have been roughly, you know, 18 to 20 inches long. And the thing about the short sword, there's really two things. Number one, it was used in tandem with the shield. You didn't go into battle with his little sword. You didn't go to the battle just with a shield. The two worked in tandem together. You had a shield to defend. And you had the sword for the offense. And so it was this maneuvering of uh, shield and sword, shield and sword. If you can imagine that, that's true of our spiritual life, right? We have faith in the Word of God. Faith in the Word of God. And the two work in tandem together. Um, You'll you'll, see it played out with Jesus after he had been in the um, wilderness for 40 days. He was tempted by the devil, and how did he, what, what sword did he use? He used the very word of God. He says, the word of God says. What was he doing? He was using the short sword, the short sword. Now, the second thing about the sword is it was used for close combat. Uh, close combat. This is when the, the battle gets the toughest. This was not shooting arrows. Um, we've talked about the arrows. The Bible says that the enemy sends towards us. Remember, they're flaming arrows. They're not just meant to hurt you. They're meant to hurt the other people around you. And we use the shield to deflect the arrows. And the enemy shoots those arrows at a distance. So I think he's a coward. But God gives us a tool for hand-to-hand close combat. And that tool is the word of God. It is the sword, not of the flesh. It is the sword of the spirit. Now, uh, I want you to flip over to Um, Hebrews chapter 4. The writer of Hebrews gives us some further clarity, some further definition about what this sword does or what the Word of God does. Hebrews 4 verse 12, the Word of God is, we're about to see three things. Number one, the Word of God is living. All right, if we're taking notes, we can write that down. The Word of God is living. Number two, the Word of God is effective. It is effective. Uh, Your version might use the word powerful, all right? It's powerful or it is effective. Number three, the Word of God is sharper. So the Word of God is sharp. It is sharper. How sharp is the Word of God? Well, it tells us it's sharper than any double-edged sword, not just single-edged, but a double-edged sword. Here's, Here's what it can do. It penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The Word of God is so sharp, it cuts, it pierces into our soul. It pierces into our spirit. It pierces into our mind, and it judges our thoughts. It even judges our intentions. That's powerful. That's sharp. I want to talk about the three things and kind of illustrate it in regards to um, a sermon, okay, a message. We, uh, we come to church and we 
Um, everything we do is a, is a matter of worship. Our bringing our tithes and offerings is a form of, of worship. Singing and proclaiming um, about who God is is a form of, of worship. The proclamation and teaching of God's word is a form of, of worship. And, and we come to hear from God. If I were to ask you the question, kind of kneecap to kneecap, do you want to hear from God today? I bet 100% of the people in the room would say yes. Absolutely. I want to hear from God. I want to know what God has to say about my situation or my circumstance or my life or this decision that I've got to make. I would love for God to really speak in to this area. We all, we all long to hear the words from our Father. Now, um, anybody here ever heard a good sermon? Ever heard a good sermon? Okay. All right. Most of you. Uh, some of you haven't. All right. That's all right. Um, <laughs> You've been attending Antioch for four years, and you didn't raise your hand. That's okay. Anybody here heard a bad sermon? We've all heard bad sermons, right? Kind of the, the misuse, misteaching of, of God's word. Um, see, here's the, here's the job of a pastor or a preacher. It's not to bring God's word to life. I've heard that, you know, and I've, I've even, remember when I was younger, you know, you got to get up there and you got to bring God's word to life. And then it kind of hit me later on, like, I don't, I don't have to bring God's word to life. It's already living. I need to get out of the way and let the word of God speak to the hearts and the minds and the souls of his people. It is living. It's not dead. These aren't just words on a page. And you, you've, you've noticed this. Sometimes you read the word and it's like something just jumps off the page at you. It is, and it's applicable to your situation. It is the living word of God. Also, it is effective. Again, your version might use the word powerful. What does this mean? It means it's useful. The word of God does something. It does something. It accomplishes a work. And God tells us that his word, it accomplishes what it's sent out to do. And it doesn't come back to him void or empty or not having accomplished what it was sent out to do. It is effective. Maybe you've been in a sermon and you've you heard a message and you're like, I needed to hear that today. Like that, that spoke to my life, like for this moment, for this situation, today. What you're saying is it is effective, it is useful. I can sink my teeth into that. Right? The word of God is is effective. And lastly, it's it's sharp. We talked about this earlier. It it pierces. Maybe you've been in a, in a sermon or at a church and you've had this thought. How does that preacher know what's going on in my life? And you even thought, you know, my spouse went and told him. <laughs> went and told him what I was going through. Told him about our situation. He has a video camera in our house and he knows the problem that we're having with our kids. Listen, that's not the preacher. That's the Holy Spirit. You see, we can only talk, we, a, a man can only talk to your ears but it is God who speaks to our hearts. So maybe you've seen in, in church through the proclamation, the teaching of God's word, you've seen the living word, the powerful, effective word, and the sharp word. But here's what I wanna remind you of. You have access to that every single day. You don't have to wait for a 30-minute message on Sundays to experience the life-giving powerful, effective, sharp word of God. You have access to it. It's our job. We need to open up and read it. And when you open up and read it, it's amazing how, again, the word comes to life and God begins to speak to us through his word. It is the word of God that is attached to truth. That, that belt, that uh, sword that a soldier wore was attached, was attached to the belt and so you have this image of we draw from truth the word of God to be able to use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Listen, you have access to the word of God. Peter says, we're to long for this. I wonder if, if it would be true of us that we long for, that we crave the word of God, or if it would be more true of us that, eh, it just kind of sits on the coffee table and we might pick it up if we're heading to church off uh, that Sunday. Long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, the word of God, you may grow in respect to your salvation. Now, I know what you may be um, asking, Andy. Can I trust it? If this is the word of God, are, are you sure that I can trust everything that's been written in this book? And to answer that question, I'm going to let Pastor Stephen come 
and share that with you. All right, so can you trust your Bible? Like the, physically the one that's in your hand, okay? The one that's on your phone, the one that was on the screen. Can you trust that? Because the Word of God says you can. I mean, Isaiah 720 B.C., he said this. He says that the, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of our God remains forever. Jesus, in 32 AD, he says that the heavens and the earth, they'll pass away, but my words will never pass away. Peter, about 30 years after this, he actually quotes Isaiah and then says this. He says, this is the word, and this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. So the scripture says, hey, God's going to protect the word. God is going to protect the scripture. You can trust it. But is that true? See, there's kind of a TikTok criticism, and I'll kind of explain why I call it a TikTok criticism. It says, you know what, the Bible, it's been around for you know, almost 2,000 years, the New Testament in particular. I mean, can you really trust that it hasn't changed in 2,000 years? years. I mean, if you played the telephone game, you know, that game that you played, you know, back in elementary school, like if I, if I whispered something to you, and then it was shared all the way around, all the way through every side, and finally got back over here, what would be the chances that it would even be half correct going from this side of the room to that side of the room? Virtually zero, right? And that's just one room. But you're talking nearly 2,000 years. So can we really trust that the New Testament is reliable? What if I told you that the telephone game is actually the perfect way to prove that the New Testament is reliable? See, there's this this historical, statistical, mathematical way of reviewing whether or not a work of antiquity is reliable or not. You collect all the known ancient manuscripts and you say, okay, how much do these manuscripts match each other? Because even if you don't have the original, if several copies of copies of copies that go out in different directions, you gather them up and you compare them, you say, okay, these are this percentage the same. Therefore, we can trust that our current copy reflects the original document. So how does the New Testament stack up against other works of antiquity? Well, usually what they do is they, they gather these manuscripts. You know, you, you need a couple, a couple dozen uh, really to make sure that the statistics, you have enough data to kind of do analytics on these things. And so let's start with a few ancient works. The first one is uh, History by Herodotus. We actually have 109 copies of this work from Herodotus. It was originally written in 425 BC, and our oldest copy is from 900 AD. So from the original writing to the oldest copy is a gap of 1,350 years. That's a long time, okay? But we have 109 copies, which is a huge sample to do data analytics on. And we trust, because of how many copies we have, that the copy we have reflects the original. Let's go with another one. Natural History by Pliny the Elder. Kind of sounds like a rap name, okay? It's not. There's a Pliny the Younger, okay? So this is Pliny the Elder, he wrote uh, this work in 79 A.D., and the oldest copy that we have is from 400 A.D. That's a 321-year gap, and we have, even more than Herodotus, we have 200 ancient manuscripts of the work Natural History. Therefore, we can use all of that data, perform a statistical analysis on it, and find, okay, we can trust that what we have reflects the original document that we do not have. 
Let's go to one that you know and you hate, the one you had to read in middle school, the Iliad, all right, by Homer. We actually have 1,757 ancient manuscripts of the Iliad. Okay, it was written in 800 BC, and we have our oldest copy is from 400 BC, so that's a gap of 400 years. But again, we have a lot of information, a lot of data, therefore, we can analyze it and know that it reflects the ancient original that we do not have. So, the question is now that we kind of had this baseline, how does the New Testament stack up against these? I mean, because these are incredible sample sizes, and we can, with mathematical certainty, know that we have good copies because of the data size. Well, the, just to give you round numbers, the New Testament was closed, let's say, at 100 A.D., okay? Let's just 100 A.D. The earliest copy that we have dates back to 114 A.D., in the grand scheme of things, that's a tiny gap. That's just a fragment. The oldest complete New Testament that we have is from 325. That is a gap of 225 years. Again, from the perspective of history, tiny, tiny gap. So what about the number of copies, right? Because I just have mentioned two. One's a fragment and one is the whole. How many copies of the New Testament do we even have? Well, just in the original language of Greek, we have 5,795 copies of the Greek New Testament. That is a huge sample size. Huge. And so we can take all of these copies and we can compare them to one another, and we can see, okay, though we don't have the original, how well do all of our copies reflect that original? But we can go even further. We actually have more copies of the New Testament that are just in other languages that were still ancient manuscripts that were translated very early. So if we add those to the Greek ones, we have 25,075 manuscripts of the New Testament. This is a sample size that can give us so much data so that we can be certain with what everything says. So, what does it say? It says that all the copies match with a 99.5% certainty. I want you to hold on to that for just a second. Let's talk about our translations. Let's kind of apply this because, you know, not everybody is into bar graphs, okay? I know this. What does this even mean? Let's look at it on a timeline, okay? 100 being when the New Testament closed, 2022 being this year, okay? Let's look at the first major English translation. There were a few before this, but let's look at the, the big one everybody knows, the King James Version in 1611, okay? We've got it there. It was based on the Textus Receptus, which was found just, or which was dated, excuse me, just about 100 years before. And that manuscript has been linked to earlier copies around uh, 1100, and so we see kind of that chain of development from those earliest manuscripts to the Textus Receptus to the King James Version. Now, don't see me hating on the King James Version, because I'm not. But I also want to talk about some newer translations as well. Let's talk about the NASB, the NIV, the NLT, the ESV, the CSB, some of these newer translations they have the benefit of being newer, meaning we've had more time to make archaeological discoveries. Well, guess what? We found a lot more manuscripts of the New Testament since the King James Version was written. Matter of fact, that one that I told you about originally from 325, that complete New Testament, the Textus Sinaiticus, sounds like you need to take a Zyrtec, you know? <laughs> 
we can base those new translations on earlier manuscripts. And the one that I told you was just 14 years, roughly after the close of the New Testament, Ryland's Papyrus, it's included too. Matter of fact, we don't just go back to the earliest, we look at them all, all 5,000. 795 manuscripts go into the translation of these modern translations. And so guess what? Whether you're looking at one of the modern ones or you're looking at the King James Version, they're all the same. Because God has protected his word throughout time. So, To use our illustration of the telephone game, if 2022 is that last person in the telephone chain and 100 AD is that first person, not only do we know that it is 99.5% the same, we also can check 5,795 links in between. Compare those all together. And again, we got that 99.5% the same. And that 0.5%, that's spelling errors or words that are transposed mostly. Nothing that affects anything major in our doctrine or our beliefs. It's all words. And believe me, I've seen some of you text. You need to give them 0.5% grace. (laughs) They were doing handwritten copies by candlelight, okay? You have autocorrect. <laughs> so when it, comes to, when it comes to all of this, what we believe as Christians is we believe that the Bible is inerrant. Let me break that word down. In means no or not. Errant means to stray like a dog. All right? It just kind of goes out and goes this way and goes that way. So when we say inerrant, we mean the Bible does not stray from how it was originally. Can I tell you something? 99.5% is the definition of not straying. And we know this as a mathematical certainty that we can trust God's word because he protected it in these past 2,000 years. You can trust the copy of God's word that you have in an app. You can trust the copy of God's word you have in a book form because God protects his word. So now that we know that we can trust the scripture, what do we do with the scripture? I want to bring your attention to Joshua 1, verse 8. Joshua 1, verse 8. Moses has just passed away. God has uh, been wor- working and talking with Moses and tells him to write these things down. He does. Compiles them into books uh, called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then here's the, the message um, that God has for Joshua. This book of instruction, in other words, uh, the, the, the writings that he had had from, uh, from Moses, this book of instruction must not depart from your coffee table. No, he says, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. In other words, it should be on your lips. You should speak these words of God. You are to meditate on it. In other words, it should also be in your mind. You meditate on it day and night. Eastern meditation is this idea that you empty your mind of all the thoughts. Uh, Christian meditation is the idea that you fill your mind with what? With the very words of God. Of God. You're to meditate on it day and night. Why would we do that? So that you may carefully observe everything written in it. In other words, the reason we speak the words of God, we, we talk about it, we share it, we, uh, we, we speak it. And the reason we think about and dwell on the word of God is so that ultimately it shows up in our life. Just like Michael Jordan, right? You don't just, you're not born a champion. It takes practice. It takes years. It takes decades of hard work. He thinks and eats and sleeps basketball. We eat and we sleep and we think the word of God. And what happens? It shows up in our everyday life for then. In other words, like after these things, then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. That means 
You'll prosper and succeed in whatever you do. That doesn't mean you'll never go through hard times. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, all right? So expect that and know that it's coming, but we can take heart because Jesus overcame the world. What it means is when we choose to align ourselves with the word of God, it will be well for us. Now, um, I want to wrap up by just talking about the word, word. Okay, you with me? Um, in the Greek, there were three words for word. We, we, we kind of all know there's three words for love. We, we use the word love to say, I love spaghetti and I love my wife, right? Um, it's kind of all over the map. There were three words for word. The word graphe, the word logos, and the word uh, rhema. Graphe, logos, rhema. Let me explain them. Graphe, it's, it's the written word, okay? It's taking words and, and writing them down. And so when you see the word graphe in scripture, it's sometimes translated word, it's sometimes translated writing, um, it's sometimes translated like sacred book. It's talking about this right here. This is the graphe. It is the written word of God. You, you can hold graphe. Uh, the word logos um, is the word um, where we get our word, English word logic. It means reasoning or like the, the first cause that explains everything. We might say the truth. John 1.1, 1, 1, the most popular use of this word, in the beginning was the word, was the logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, now who was the word? Um, it goes on to say the word became flesh. Okay, so, so reason and truth and logic like, came to us in the personhood of Jesus Christ. So then you could look upon logos. So, so logos is this idea of this is the message, if you write a note, okay, to your son or to your daughter, and you say, I love you, what you're writing is graphe, but the message, the truth is, I love you, the logos. But then you have a third level, that's, that's the word rhema. This is the actual spoken declaration. It's when you, you grab your, your child, and you, and you hold them, and you hug them, and you say, I love you, it's, it, the, the word rhema means an utterance. It's the, it's the utterance. And so you might utter something that gets written down. You might utter, okay, you can, uh, you can rhema a logos that gets graphe. Does that make, uh, are you with me on that? All right. So let's tie all this together. When Paul said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which word did he use? He didn't say the graphe. He didn't say take the graphe. He didn't say take the, the logos, the reason or the truth. But the word that Paul uses is the word rhema. Take the rhema. In other words, take the word that God is speaking to you. I asked you earlier, would you like to hear a word from God? I mean, wouldn't you just love for God to speak to your soul, to your heart? I think we all would say, yes, but how do we, how do, we do that? How do we get a rhema? Well, let me show you. When you read the graphe, to study the logos, God gives a rhema. Listen, I'm very, very wary of people who come and say, thus says the Lord. God, God said this. I'm, I'm very, very, very skeptical, very careful of that because I don't know. I don't know. But when we go to the graphe, and we don't just go to it to learn about history and learn facts and information, but when we go to the graphe to study the logos, to study the truth, to look upon Jesus Christ and to become a mirror image of, of him. When we study the logos, here's what happens. God gives us a rhema. And if you've read God's word, if you've opened it up, you've, you've seen the words jump off the page and you've thought, wow, I've read this passage 5,000 times. But right now, it seems like God is speaking to me about this circumstance. Man, I've, I've been in those situations I've been in those situations where I'm, I'm like, man, I got this going on, and I know that I'm in the right, and I'll go to God's word, and it'll be something that God just speaks to my heart. Andy, you need to, you need to adjust here. What is that? That is a rhema. It is, a, it is my heavenly Father speaking to me through the logos and through the graphe. 
So here's what I want, I want to close, just with two kind of things. Number one, I believe it's so important that we study the logos, the graphe, with other people. That we don't just come at it alone. Look, Christian living is not just done in isolation on your own. Look, the enemy loves for you to be isolated. He knows he can deceive people in isolation, so we need a community. And I believe that small group community where you can sit around the, the living room or the dining room table with other people and, and, and read the graphe, to study the logos, to get a rhema, that God speaks to us through the people that he places around us. And we so value that. One of the things that, um, that we want to grow in our ministry here at Antioch is in this area of small groups. We have about 22 small groups right now that meet all over Williamson, Williamson County. That's 22 groups of people that are reading the graphe together to study the logos, to understand a rhema. That's a beautiful thing. But for a church our size, we need about 45 or 50 of those small groups. And so to make a move, to start pursuing that goal, um, God's been blessing our church financially, and we've, we've budgeted that this, uh, this year, a new staff position. And so I'm, I'm publicly announcing you today that we're hiring uh, Mr. Jake Smith. Um, he's waving at you at the back. He's going to serve as our full-time small groups lead. <laughs> Stepping away from an 18-year career as a captain in EMS because he feels called to serve the Lord. We're just excited to see how God uses him and the sacrifice that, that, that he is making. We could not be more excited. We want to just share that um, with you today. Also, I want to leave just by encouraging you, what area of your life do you need a rhema? You do need the spoken word of God. Listen, as a, as a father, I can look at my kids and, and see what they're going through. And, and, and sometimes because you know them, you know exactly what they need to hear in this particular moment. Listen, God knows what you need to hear, but he's not going to yell at you. He's not going to yell at you. He's not going to shout, but he'll whisper. And so we tune in, and we listen for the rhema by reading the graphe and studying the logos.